Out of all the storytelling mediums available, video games are far and away the most effective in terms of delivering an immersive and engaging experience. Interactivity is key as to why video games stand head and shoulders above other mediums as watching TV or movies or reading books are more of a passive activity. Being an active participant in a story, no matter how much or how little, creates a real tangible link between the player and the game world you rarely get with other mediums. You're Jill Valentine heading down that dark hallway, you're Sonic breaking the sound barrier, you're the one rocking out on stage, you're Nathan Drake hanging off of a train. This is one of the main reasons why movie adaptations of video games usually don't pan out. Granted, most of the time it's Hollywood not understanding the properties they're working with, but it's also because part of the reason why you play Monster Hunter or Street Fighter is because you're actually playing it and not watching it being played out. Video games are also an extremely diverse medium. The amount of genres available is almost endless. Couple that with the various markets and there's real potential for a swath of experiences to be had. This is what makes video games such an exciting medium in my opinion because there's near endless possibilities of what you can play and experience. Traditional gameplay experiences are about gameplay and mechanics. From getting the high score in Pac-Man to getting lost in the world of The Witcher 3, these experiences are the norm. The big reveal at E3 or the games that push console sales. And while I'm obviously a fan of these games, there's a whole other side of the industry producing just as powerful experiences with little to no comparative features. The indie scene has the flexibility to create more incredible and experimental experiences and have done so since the gaming industry was born. The most compelling games out of the indie market are those who take the medium and utilize it in interesting ways, whether that's gameplay or story-wise. One of the games that exemplifies this the best is Giant Sparrow's What Remains of Edith Finch. In a genre most cynically referred to as walking simulators, What Remains of Edith Finch is a narrative-driven game centered around an unfortunate family whose history is chronicled by the stories they left behind. It has a very similar structure to games like Firewatch, Gone Home, or The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. As Edith Finch is a game solely focused on its narrative, I highly recommend playing through this one by yourself with no prior knowledge to get the most out of it. Fair warning, I will be spoiling some of this game's story. As the titular Edith Edith Finch, players return to the family home deep within the woods of Washington State. Edith's goal is to uncover the lost stories of her ancestors in her journal in order to teach her unborn child about their family. The Finches are haunted by misfortune. Since immigrating from Norway in the late 1800s, the family has lost member after member to unfortunate circumstances to the point of believing the family is cursed. Edith arrives years after her mother had whisked her away in the middle of the night. After Edith's mother passes away, she is the last Finch alive. For the sake of her child and to satisfy her own curiosity, she returns to her childhood home to catalog everything she can about each family member by gathering information about them from the house. This setup is interesting enough to get you invested, but where Edith Finch excels is how these stories are told. There are two main gameplay portions, for lack of a better word. The the main section is controlling Edith as she explores the house, and the other parts are the stories she comes across about her family members. The game balances these very well, as wandering the house and the premises is always broken up by playable memory of sorts. Now, many will criticize the use of the word game when describing what remains of Edith Finch because there's nothing denoting traditional gameplay elements. There's no high scores, or shooting, or jumping on bad guys, or skill points, or anything like that. The majority of the game is walking and interacting with one's environment. I used to be of the mindset that these weren't actually games by the proper definition, but more interactive movies. Movies. Although these games are very bare bones, this outlook isn't very constructive, as some of the earliest games to date had no gameplay, so to speak. Text adventures like Zork were as basic as they come, but they were a pivotal stepping stone in gaming history. If a game knows what it is and executes it brilliantly, then it deserves enough respect to be talked about in the same conversation as any other game. What Remains of Edith Finch is confident in its story and storytelling, and it most certainly has the right to be. What Remains of Edith Finch is not a long game by any means, about two hours or so, but for that short time I was constantly captivated by the story stories it had to tell, and more importantly, the way it told them. First, you've probably noticed the text. While fully voice acted, Edith Finch also has accompanying text, but not as just mere subtitles for accessibility purposes. The text is organic, as it's always placed in areas the player is currently looking, or displayed in interesting ways to accent whatever's happening on screen. This is a great stylistic choice because it not only keeps players on the right track, but also adds this emphasis on the words that are being spoken. Lewis told me there were secret passages, but I never believed him. Turns out, my mom was really good at keeping secrets. Now it was time to find out what my mom had been afraid of. <laughs> This makes them more impactful and coupled with the great voice acting throughout really drives home the stories the Finch house has to tell. From a traditional gameplay structure, each family on this cute family tree Edith has drawn has their own story and therefore its own way of portraying said story. The way each story is told is themed based off each family member's quirks and character. Each member of the family has their own room in the Finch house, which is this whimsical, almost fantastical structure. The juxtaposition of the game's tone and its setting creates this oddly satisfying balance of morbid death and this Lemony Snicket-esque architecture. Since Edith Finch is light on 
on gameplay, its visuals and story have to carry most if not all of the weight, and it does so tremendously well. Visually, on a technical front, What Remains of Edith Finch still looks very good for an indie game released nearly five years ago. The strength in its visuals is how much detail is packed into the Finch house. Even without the dialogue, you can glean so much information from what each room contains. Sticky notes, cluttered desks filled with books, posters and trophies, knickknacks. Each family member's room is almost a personified version of themselves, representing who they were when they were alive. All of the war and photography memorabilia in Sam's room, Lewis's room adorned with hippie paraphernalia, Barbara's room that perpetually stuck in the 1960s. The visual design of each room does a great job of creating an image in the player's head of who these people were when they were alive, and their stories solidify this. Each family member's story is unique to them and tailored to their personality. Each depicts the character and their death, giving you a slice of who they were and their tragic end. These are, without a doubt, the best part of the game and the reason why I was inspired to write about it, and it goes back to why I love video games in the first place. When you get right down to it, What Remains of Edith Finch could very well have been a novel or a short miniseries on Netflix or HBO. It would certainly still work as an emotionally driven narrative in those mediums, but because it's an interactive video game, the developers over at Giant Sparrow were able to do some pretty special things to get across the themes and ideas they were going for in a much more powerful way. For instance, one of the twins of Sven and Edie, Calvin, died when he was just about 11 years old. Edith comes across a letter written by Calvin's twin, Sam, when he was around the same age. He describes his brother the way he saw him, how even at his young age he craved adventure. He had his fair share of bumps and bruises, and he disregarded danger because he found the fun in living life to its fullest. Calvin always had an interest in astronomy and wanted badly to be able to be an astronaut. As Sam is recounting his brother the way he wants to remember him, the player, as Calvin, has to pump while on a swing as he goes higher and higher and higher until... That's what I want to remember about my brother. The day he made it to nine o'clock, and he did. Again, this scene could very well be replicated in a TV show or movie, but at least in my opinion, wouldn't be as impactful because you're physically interacting with this moment in a video game. Every story in the game is like this, where players are inserted into the person's life for a brief moment, making their death more powerful in the process. Each story is themed to each character, so while the structure is the same throughout, each story feels that much more unique. For example, Barbara's story is framed around the retelling of her death via this horror-themed comic book. Sam's story is told through a series of pictures the player has to take. Little Gregory might be one of my favorites, as you see the world through the eyes of an infant taking a bath. But the story that blew me away and was the catalyst for me making this impromptu video is Lewis's story. Lewis is Edith's brother, someone she would hang out and play video games with on a regular basis. She was close to Lewis, which makes his death even more impactful. Lewis was seeing a psychiatrist for his substance abuse. This abuse of both marijuana and alcohol is linked to Lewis blaming himself for his brother Milton's disappearance. After becoming sober and getting a job at the local cannery, Lewis quickly realized how monotonous and repetitive normal life was. Working a 9-to-5 job, being another cog in the machine's so to speak, wore on Lewis to the point his mind started to fabricate and imagine a new life for himself. His daydreaming at work was the only solace he had from the tedium of his job. He would zone out, go into autopilot as his mind created something more interesting. He created an entire world of his own where he was king and ruled towns and cities. This world became more desirable than the one he actually inhabited, to the point where he wouldn't go home and his mother had to drag him back to reality after work. He began to resent the Lewis in the real world as the imagination grew out of control to the point it strongly implied he committed suicide. Rest, I think you know. Mrs. Finch, your son, was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. Lewis's tragic tale could have been read off a page or shown in a TV show, but in Edith Finch, the player actively gets to experience exactly what Lewis was thinking and imagining. Lewis's job had him grabbing fish, cutting their head off, and pushing them onto a conveyor belt for hours on end. Using the right stick, players control Lewis's hand, repeating this task over and over. After a short while, Lewis's imagination starts up, taking himself through a 2D maze. This is controlled with the left stick, while simultaneously using the right stick to continue chopping up the fish. This is absolutely brilliant game design, and it blew me away how simple yet powerful something like this was in conveying how Lewis felt in these moments. As the imaginary world becomes more and more powerful, it shifts from 2D to isometric to fully 3D, all while the borders of his imaginary world start to slowly take over reality, and all while the player and Lewis are still repeating the same motion of grabbing a fish, 
cutting its head off and pushing it towards the conveyor belt. Lewis's story is ingenious in its execution and could not have been done as effectively in any other medium. That's the magic of video games, and it's why What Remains of Edith Finch works so well. The game's conclusion ties everything together on a gameplay and storytelling front as beautifully as it can. I won't spoil it because it's a bit of a tearjerker, but all I can say is that the title, What Remains of Edith Finch, is a perfectly poignant one. From the outside looking in, a two-hour walking simulator is nowhere near as enticing as a grandiose photorealistic cowboy adventure, but it doesn't really have to be. Giant Sparrow knew exactly the story they wanted to tell, and they knew the medium of video games was powerful enough to deliver it in a way no other could. What Remains of Edith Finch made me appreciate just how special games truly are. For every Sonic or Mario, Call of Duty or Battlefield, Skyrim or The Witcher, there's a game like What Remains of Edith Finch that showcases just how versatile this industry is. You don't need high scores or kill streaks or stat bonuses to be a great gaming experience. You just need a dedicated team to come together and make something remarkable. Thank you.